Good afternoon, and uh, you are very welcome uh, to today's IIEA event, which takes part as part of the Global Europe project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, this project aims to analyze uh, and uh, communicate to the wider public uh, the debate on the future of Europe, um, uh, on the European Union's role in the world, uh, and on Ireland's role um, in the multilateral order. Um, we are delighted um, to be joined today by uh, Vera Jourova, the European Commission Vice President for Values and Transparency, uh, who's been generous enough to take uh, time uh, out of her busy schedule to speak to us um, today. Um, uh, Vice President Jourova will speak to us for uh, about 20 to 25 minutes, uh, and then uh, we will move on to a question and uh, answer uh, session with our audience. Uh, now, you'll be able to uh, join uh, the discussion uh, using your uh, Q&A function uh, on Zoom, which you should be able to see uh, on your screens. Um, uh, please feel free to send in uh, your questions uh, throughout the session uh, as those questions uh, occur to you, uh, and we will come to them uh, once Commissioner uh, Jarova has concluded uh, her presentation. Um, if I could please request uh, that you, you keep your questions uh, as brief as possible so that we can get as many uh, as possible in during the event, uh, that would be great. And we would ask also guests uh, to identify themselves and their affiliation uh, before um, asking the speaker um, a, a question. Um, a reminder too that today's presentation and uh, Q&A uh, are both uh, on the record. Uh, and uh, uh, please feel free also uh, to, to join the discussion on Twitter, should you, so, uh, uh, so, should, should you feel so inclined. Uh, the handle is at II. EA. Um, uh, we're also live streaming uh, this afternoon's discussion, so a very warm uh, welcome uh, to all of you tuning in uh, via YouTube, uh, and indeed what we have to say uh, will be um, uh, uploaded uh, to the Institute's web the website and to YouTube uh, later on uh, as, uh, as well. Now I'd like to uh, formally uh, introduce uh, Vice President Jourova, and then I will hand the floor um, over to her. Um, uh, Vera Jourova is uh, currently Vice President of the European Commission uh, for Values and Transparency, and she deals uh, with uh, democracy, the rule of law, uh, media pluralism, and the fight against uh, disinformation, which are all areas that would keep anyone, uh, I think, very well occupied in this, uh, in this day and age. Um, uh, from 2014 to 2019, she served as the EU Commissioner for Justice, Consumers, and uh, Gender uh, Equality. Um, in 2014, before arriving to the European Commission, uh, Ms. Jourova held the position of Minister for Regional Development in the Czech Republic. Uh, and prior to this from 2016 to 2013. Uh, she worked in her own company uh, as an international consultant on uh, European Union funding and was also involved in consultancy activities in the Western Balkans uh, relating to uh, European Union uh, accession. Uh, she holds a, a master's degree in law uh, and a master's degree in uh, the theory of culture from the Charles University um, uh, Prague, which is a, a place I've been very privileged uh, to visit uh, myself um, uh, in the past, and we are delighted to have her here uh, with us today. So without further ado, if I may, I will uh, hand the floor over to you uh, now. Um, the last one. Dear Professor Barrett, thank you very much for your, uh, not only warm welcome now, and but also for the invitation, uh, which is a great honor for me and pleasure. And of course, I would not like to speak too long and rather to listen and to be able to react. And so my plea to you, just stop me when you think it's too long, because when I get into the turbulence of my own speech, <laughs> I sometimes don't know don't know when to when to finish. And thank you for not killing more than three three minutes by my CV because I indeed I have a long CV, <laughs> but it was it was enough. Um, we uh, will discuss uh, the the issues relating to the the media freedom and media pluralism. And uh, the this this topic is so much connected with the EU values. I feel that uh, I think that uh, it's uh, it's a very important topic. And uh, when I compare it with the previous commission and previous mandate, I didn't hear too much about uh, us at the European level dealing with the with the media sector. And I always found it appropriate thing not to do it, not to engage too much, not to interfere. Uh, uh, and uh, in the meantime, we received uh, every year more and more varying data uh, showing that the media in the EU are under extreme pressure. 
and the pressure is economic, a very unfair business model when the money of the advertisers have shifted in a relatively short time to the digital uh, systems, uh, big digital players, uh, uh, the enormous uh, uh, economic pressure, uh, which also might lead into some kind of vulnerability of media and then uh, the easier targets for politicization and getting payments from the national budget, which also means that the there should be some kind of editorial gratitude from the media expected. Uh, and uh, we, we see that uh, what is also a worrying trend is uh, a worsened situation of security of journalists. We have murdered journalists, we have many injured journalists, we ha have a lack of protection of journalists, especially during the protests, which are very frequent now in the EU. So over years, we thought that we should do more because we cannot rely on media anymore as uh, on the, one of the pillars of, of democracy and not being able to protect the media better. This, does, this will not work. That's why the commission decided to come with several initiatives, uh, which are now in the making or already uh, should be somewhat somehow implemented in the member states. And I know that you are not curious about my analysis. You are better in that yourself, but you want to hear which solutions and which, which measures, which methods we invented to protect the, the media better. Uh, before I will get, get into this, this topic of, of solutions or methods or measures, I want to say that COVID time uh, even uh, worsened the situation rapidly for the media, uh, especially their economic situation, but also the, the security of, of, of journalists. So um, it, it is only another argument for, for doing something. And that something is outlined in our democracy, European Democracy Action Plan, where uh, uh, we um, foresee concrete measures, legislation and non-legislative measures uh, to protect the media, to protect elections in the EU and to do more against disinformation. And if you have not read it, you know, we are not always uh, producers of very exciting literature <laughs> as, as the commission or European legislators, but we tried in this European Democracy Action Plan to come with a very well thought through and on data well-based analysis of where we are today in Europe, also when it comes to the freedom of speech and uh, organization of the information space. Uh, I know it sounds rather worrying that somebody wants to organize the information space, but when you look at uh, what's happening online, then you realize that uh, we, we should uh, look at uh, the, the ways, the channels, how trustworthy information are getting the, are, uh, are uh, reaching the, the people. And so in this European Democracy Action Plan, we are coming with with the, uh, with the set of, of different initiatives which we are uh, fulfilling. The first is the safety of, of journalists. Yesterday, I had an honor to open a conference with Dmitry Muratov, uh, the editor-in-chief of Novaya Gazeta, one of the very few independent media left in, in Russia. And for a very strong reason, Dmitry Muratov and Maria Reza got the Nobel Prize for Peace because they are the heroes of these days and they are not alone. Uh, we have hundreds, thousands of, of courageous people working in media who are bringing their skin on the market and who are permanent targets of especially online attacks. But very often the online attacks then result in, in uh, attacks in real life. Uh, the Slovak uh, journalist uh, 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 Jan Kuciak, uh, was receiving threat attacks uh, and, 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 and threat, threat through internet, through, through his online channels. Uh, it was announced to the police, the police didn't do anything, and then he was murdered. So we came with the set of recommendations to the member states with the warning, look, you are obliged to guarantee the security of people in your country. And the journalists are working in public interest they deserve strong security 
uh, gar uh, measures guaranteed by the state. And we issued this recommendation. We, I am uh, engaging in bilateral talks with member states where we see increased threats or increased uh, security uh, risks for the journalists. And we are really pushing that the member states uh, implement in full our recommendations, which are very concrete, very concrete. Uh, legal aid, shelters, protection of, of the, of the uh, of the PCs and, and technologies of journalists. I, I will not go into more details, but we expect the member states to take action. And we need to see in, in decreasing numbers because last year it was a, cool, a really cool, I think the, hopefully the peak because we had 900 injured journalists uh, in 20 member states physically injured. So this, this uh, cannot, cannot continue. And we expect the member states to vigorously investigate and prosecute all criminal acts against journalists. And we also encourage them to work with uh, Europol, Eurojust, uh, because uh, the, the, it, uh, the attacks against the journalists are always um, uh, based on organized crime, which has no borders in the EU. That's why the European response is also needed. Uh, we also see that the attempt to silence journalists, to, to, to uh, impose pressure on them so that they stop doing what they are doing can be done through justice system. It sounds strange. And as the former justice commissioner, it's not easy for me to say it, but I don't want to see the courts abused uh, in, uh, and, and stand on the side of those who are rich and powerful and can uh, uh, launch the procedures against the journalists, which are very long, which are very costly, and which uh, have the potential to stop the journalists in, 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 their, in their work. And the journalists working for big media houses, of course, uh, they can stand it maybe because uh, the houses have some buffer, financial buffer, uh, and, and the lawyers to defend the journalists. But we have a plenty of free freelancers. We have a plenty of small uh, media outlets who can, can uh, through the justice procedures or judiciary procedures, be forced to stop, stop the work. So I want to propose uh, at the end of, of uh, April, the legislation, uh, the, we call it anti-slap legislation, which should make it more difficult to win the cases, uh, which will uh, uh, ask the judges to check first whether the, the procedure or whether the, the complaint they receive is not of purely abusive nature, whether it is it's substantiated. And, of course, we have to balance the access to justice for those who might be harmed by uh, uh, journalists. Uh, so we, we cannot disbalance the system and to create some kind of uh, uh, privileged casta of journalists, but, but we have to stop the trend because more and more these judicial proceedings are abused against the journalists uh, in a very mani manifestly clear, clear way. Uh, so. This is uh, the anti-slap. We will recommend the member states to uh, introduce the changes in the civil and ad administrative procedures, uh, uh, law procedures. We will come with the legislation for cross-border cases. What initiated uh, this uh, action of the commission? Uh, I am sure you know that Daphne Carona Galizia, the Maltese journalist who was murdered, uh, uh, for what she was doing as, as a journalist at, at the time of her assassination, uh, there were 47 litigations running, mainly in the United Kingdom. And the, 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 her family is still facing these litigations still now after several years. Uh, and I am in constant co contact with uh, her sons. I met her parents in, in, at the cemetery in, in Malta and I promised that, that we will protect the journalists better, also against these abusive litigations. Uh, the, the main jewel on the, on the crown of uh, what the commission wants to do to protect the journal, journalists and the media 
is the Media Freedom Act, which we planned for July this year. Uh, and here we would like to come with a set of standards which have to be guaranteed by all member states. The, the safeguards and uh, the standards which will guarantee the independence and pluralism uh, in media sector. Uh, when we see some worrying trends in some member states, when we saw the crisis of TV and uh, uh, in in uh, in Poland, when we saw the situation of Club Radio in in Hungary, and and uh, the attempts to uh, increase the pressure on both public and private media in in some other member states, we realized that at the European level, uh, we do not have any protection, any special protection for the media in our EU rules. And I was heavily asked by many, what will you do? Jourova, you are responsible for that. And I had to say, we have competition rules. We have the rules for the European single market. And here the media are protected the same way as any other producer of something on our market. The producers of shoes, for instance. And so this is this Media Freedom Act should bring a difference to upgrade the protection of media and to uh, set the procedure uh, uh, which will enable Europe to act also. Uh, but first of all, what we want is to strengthen the competencies of the national regulatory bodies uh, in, and their ability, ability to act. Uh, I can imagine on freedom, uh, medium, uh, freedom, freedom Act, you will, you might have questions. So I will, I will now continue to the fight against disinformation. Here, of course, we are looking at the platforms and uh, the digital, digital sources, digital channels. Uh, we have a very strong principle in the EU that we protect the freedom of speech, even the speech of those who have different opinions from us. That's our obligation. At the same time, I would not like us to abandon the principle that truth matters in Europe. We have to uphold both. And so when we look at the content which we see on internet, uh, uh, we see a lot of crime being distributed through the channels, through the social media and through the websites. Uh, it's hate speech, which is defined as the speech which may, which has the potential to incite violence in real life. That's the definition. Hate speech, which is defined in all EU member states criminal laws. Then we have terrorism and then we have child pornography and child abuse uh, materials. This is a, a especially disgusting chapter and, and disgusting thing, which we have to put an end to. So we, we are preparing also measures against, uh, against this. Uh, this is prohibited content. This is not a prohibited content for online only. This is prohibited content, co content for real life in Europe. And what's illegal offline? has to be uh, treated as illegal online. That's why in the Digital Services Act, which we adopted already last year, and which is now in a very mature stage of, of uh, 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 legislative uh, uh, procedure, which has the chance to be adopted soon, uh, we want the platforms to take proactive uh, measures to remove such content, to cooperate with law enforcement authorities, uh, to increase uh, their responsibility and accountability when it comes to setting up our algorithms, that the algorithms themselves should not dr drive uh, the production of crime. Uh, for disinformation, it's another story. That's why you would not find it in the Digital Services Act, which is very hard, legally binding set of rules. We work on this disinformation through the uh, code of practice, uh, which uh, should be finalized in March, where we want the, the platforms and the, the, the administrators of the websites and uh, 
the media and the advertising industry to consolidate or somehow accumulate or coordinate their work against disinformation. Uh, it's it's more about it's not about removing content, but more more about fact checking. Here comes again again the topic of the financial distress on media. We pressure we, we impose pressure on the platforms to pay the fact checkers, especially the journalists, for their work for the fact checking. Uh, so uh, this is one of the methods how we want to. Uh, in, uh, ensure that some money uh, collected by big platforms will come back to where the, the, the proper job is done. Uh, one way is copyright, but I will, I will not go into that. But uh, through this code of practice, we want to decrease the impact of disinformation on, on, on a European uh, society. We work with Joseph Borrell on, on a sanction uh, method against the foreign actors and foreign uh, interference, uh, which is heavily needed. When we when we look at the the disinformation over flooding the European information space, uh, with a, uh, pro uh, being produced uh, by pro Kremlin sources, either directly in Russia or by by their European proxies. 40% uh, of the pieces of disinformation which we caught through our networks were targeted against Ukraine. And this is pan-European uh, propagandist effort of Russia. This is not only spread through the Central and Eastern European countries, which used to be the case in the past. So Ukraine and, and anti-vaccine, uh, COVID-related disinformation, all that is so dangerous and so harmful that we have to uh, trigger some self-defensive measures and, and mechanisms uh, and how to do it without uh, demolishing the principle of freedom of speech. This is what we try to do through the code of practice against this information. Uh, I, I think I should stop already, but uh, maybe uh, on, on financing. Uh, yeah, one more thing on, on media. Uh, our plan is to strengthen the position of media in Europe, which means, especially through the Media Freedom Act, to decrease the influence of the states and decrease the influence of the economic players. It is logical because what the data shows, what the data from the media pluralism monitor suggests is that there is an increased pressure, political and economic pressure. So our, our effort will be to decrease it and to protect the journalists better through the anti-slap. To do that, we need to see that there is uh, the bottom-up effort from the media sector itself uh, to guarantee professionalism and responsibility uh, which is adequate to the power of media, which we want to strengthen. So logically, if we want to strengthen the media power, we want to see the responsibility uh, increased and there are very in important initiatives already now which we fully support, which is especially the Global Journalism Trust Initiative, where, as, as far as I know, last year, Ireland's national television and radio broadcaster announced it would be the first Irish media organization to sign up to this initiative. And we are encouraging this initiative and others because we need to, by, by strengthening the role of media and increasing the protection, we need to be sure that the media will go hand in hand with us and will guarantee uh, uh, the highest possible trustworthiness of, of the work of, of the media. Uh, so that's that's from my side on, on, the, on uh, what we plan as new rules and, and new, new measures. Also, this might be about the money. So uh, last summer, the commission launched the first ever call for journalism partnerships under the Creative Europe program. 
Uh, it is uh, it was the call for 7.6 million euro. We will soon announce the results. We are also working on a new equity pilot project, uh, collaborating with philanthropic foundations to join forces to support the media sector. The, the, the project uh, would come at a boost as a boost to the financial independence of media outlets. Uh, I strongly believe that by working together across borders, media may be stronger. So we are also uh, pro pro promoting and funding the cross-border uh, investigative projects, such as the recent Pandora Papers. Uh, uh, no, we are not supporting the, this, this concrete investigative uh, action, but uh, we want to promote uh, the cooperation uh, of, the media, uh, uh, of the media in the future because we see incredible results such such Pandora papers. So this is a tricky thing when I say that uh, the EU will be funding the media. Of course, there is a, always a quick question. What do you want for it? What are you buying? And I want to say uh, we want to buy big certainty that the media will uh, be stronger and will will do uh, good work. And our special uh, attention is to the uh, goes to the cross border cooperation, uh, which I think is appropriate angle. Uh, or, or perspective for, for the Commission to, to, to look into that. So, Mr. Uh, Barrett, I am at the end uh, of my uh, contribution, but of course, uh, uh, starting to concentrate for the questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Vice President. That was uh, fascinating and it's uh, very interesting to see um, uh, all of the activities that um, the, the European Union and uh, the initiatives that the European Union uh, and the Commission in particular are taking um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in this regard. Uh, so just to remind um, uh, everyone that um, uh, it is possible um, to uh, put questions uh, using the question and answer function on the um, uh, on the, the, the Zoom function and uh, we'd uh, look forward to getting as many uh, questions as, uh, as possible for you. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, having the, the um, uh, Commission mm -hmm. Vice President here with us uh, today. So um, hopefully we'll be able to use that uh, as, uh, as, much, uh, as much as possible. Uh, we have uh, just to begin here um, a question from uh, Seamus Allen, uh, who's uh, an IIEA um, digital um, uh, researcher. And um, um, uh, 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 Seamus uh, has asked him, um, how can protection of <coughs> freedom of speech and free protection of free media be balanced with, uh, at the same time, countering, counter, countering disinformation and hate speech? So essentially the, the, um, uh, the, the, the question of, uh, of freedom of speech, uh, that, uh, you know, what, what, uh, uh, to what extent is this going to be protected uh, and balanced uh, with the other interests that you've mentioned? Uh, may, may I immediately answer? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, two two ways how I am looking at it. Uh, uh, I will start by maybe saying something which is not very popular, but uh, we let the disinformation to flourish because we are not sufficiently protecting the truth, mm -hmm. trustworthy information. We saw it in COVID time. Uh, the the health authorities in many member states were not able to provide the public the information which was needed. So it was an obvious call and invitation for the producers of this information to occupy the space. And we have to, I, I will never say that we will get rid of this information and fake news, uh, by the way, they were with us <laughs> over the whole history. Yeah? When, you, when you read uh, Harari and uh, his chapter about the the importance of, of rumors in, in, in the old tribes life. This, this has always been with us, uh, but uh, we, uh, we neglected something important that we have to pay attention on, and take care of the, the information which uh, has to be delivered to the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to adapt to this new era, which uh, enables us to use the digital tools to inform and to fact check 
and to add our opinions, we can use the tools and we should use the tools better. Uh, because on the other hand, there are those who abuse these tools. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would like all of us, and when I see us, I mainly speak about the establishment, about the political sphere, about the scientists, about the, the media, about culture uh, people. Uh, you know, we have obligation to uh, uphold the truth. And we have the tools available as well as those who are abusing them. So, and it's not that uneasy to predict what will be the subjects for this information. Yeah, now with the Green Deal, of course, it's already here. Increased of prices of, of gas and energy. This is the Green Deal fault. Yeah, increased uh, prices of, of food. Uh, it will be the, the green, green Deal fault in the future. Uh, migration, minorities. This is, these are the, the topics which are extremely uh, uh, targeted by disinformation. So we have to, to occupy the space better. Uh, on, the, on the negative side, the fight against this information, uh, the, the active fight, we need the media uh, for the fact checking and for uh, bringing into the information space the trustworthy information. I had some period in the past when I spoke to the, the journalists uh, I, I remember it was in Paris, I think two years ago, they said that I am instrumentalizing them in the fight against media, uh, against the disinformation. And I said, if, if you want to read it like that, yes, I am. We need you. We need you. Mm -hmm. So these are two ways. And I'm afraid that for this occupying the space with uh, uh, the narratives which are based on the facts uh, I think that here we have a horrible gap. Okay, interesting. That's a, that, uh, thank you very much indeed um, uh, for that. Um, 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 some so definitely some some thoughts that need to be thought about very deeply there. All right. Um, we we have a question in from Eileen uh, Colotti, who is um, a postgraduate uh, researcher um, uh, in uh, Dublin uh, City uh, University, uh, and uh, she says that uh, you mentioned uh, getting. Uh, uh, platforms uh, to pay uh, fact checkers. Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, elaborate uh, on that, uh, please, uh, and how uh, the independence uh, of uh, such uh, fact checkers uh, would be um, uh, 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 would be assured? And uh, currently, fact checkers, uh, Eileen says, are financially dependent on Facebook and are bound to Facebook rules. Uh, so, for instance, they're not uh, uh, free to speak freely. Uh, to uh, researchers. So that's Eileen uh, Colotti, who's a postdoctoral researcher uh, 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 in uh -huh. the Institute for Future Media and Journalism uh -huh. in City uh -huh. Okay, yes, but may I, may I jump uh, for a while back? Um, we are also facing now the, the, the new phenomenon that lying is winning elections. Hmm. And that's, that's bad. What is worse, uh, lying by anonymous, Mm. is winning elections. That's why I like to attract your attention to something I didn't mention. Uh, we came with rather tough regulation, uh, which is coming with the stricter rules for online political campaigning. Yeah, which, which is one of the initiatives under the European Democracy Action Plan. And uh, we, we want to come back to old good, good times. Electoral campaigns have always contained manipulation, yeah? Mm -hmm. Even when I knock the door of my hopefully future voter, I will try to manipulate the lady <laughs> at the doorstep, telling her that I am the best choice. <laughs> but you see the magnitude of manipulation of, of, uh, of electoral choices and, and uh, electoral uh, behavior uh, of, of the potential voters I, I think that we, we are doing the right thing, uh, coming with the, with the very strict, strict rules. Everything has to be signed, who paid for it. Uh, the people must see that is is paid for uh, advertisement and no micro-targeting on the basis of sensitive data. We are not sheep which go to the slaughter. We are the voters who want to cast our autonomous vote. So, so I just wanted to attract your attention to this. Uh, how the fact checkers should be 
paid. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, fact checking is a, a highly uh, professional work, which requires ex experience and responsibility and trustwor trustworthiness. And that's why we are uh, really pushing uh, those who are offering the space for disinformation and monetizing it to hire the cleaning service. And I don't mean cleaning in the sense of removing content. I have to emphasize it again. We want the facts to be placed next to the disinformation so that the people can make their choice. Uh, that is unfortunately something, something very natural against us that the people have a tendency to believe what they want to believe. And it's my case, I have the algorithm in my stomach and uh, the author of the algorithm is my granny and my father. <laughs> I know very well at my age why I react, how I react. These are these first hand and first, second emotional reactions. This information is not addressing our brain, it's addressing our basic instincts and emotions. And but for those who do not want to be driven and chased by, by their emotions, we need the fact checkers. Uh, to provide them with the facts so that they can switch on the brains. And this work has to be paid. So the EU is paying the several projects uh, under the headline of, of EDMO, that's the European uh, uh, Observatory, which uh, is now going to, to different member states. And the, these EDMOs or the national EDMOs are uh, collecting, uh, uh, gathering the people who are doing the fact checking. So this is paid from public money. I, I will not give you the, the figures now. Uh, it's not much, but, but we are supporting it financially. And uh, so if you want to join uh, the, the, those who are working under, under these, uh, these organizations, uh, you can find it and, and, uh, and somehow express your, your, your interest. But for the the Google and others, there is a very strong push from our side. You have to pay the cleaning service. You have to hire the people, you have to uh, work with them, you have to work with them in all member states, in all 24 uh, national languages. Nobody should be left behind. There are no small and big languages in the EU. And uh, I don't want to I don't have to remind us of the fact that if the disinformers will win in one member state or two, and what is the, the victory about? It's about the demolition of democracy, which might be caused by influencing more than 40% of citizens. Count with me, you are, you are the academics, you know better these figures, but 40% uh, is the critical mass then the whole Europe will have a horrible problem. That's why we are pushing uh, the, the platforms to pay the fact checkers in all the member states, all the languages. The problem is what is being announced to me several times already, that they are uh, confronted with a, a sad reality that some of the fact checkers who are offering the services are uh, the, the, the activists who want to push their own, or, or own opinions into this. Yeah, let them do it, but for their own money. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm rather cruel on that one, but uh, we, we need to check the, 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 the facts to be corrected. Yeah. But the opinions, they belong to each of us. And unless these are the opinions which have that potential to incite violence or, or killing, no mercy, it has to be removed. It doesn't have to be check, fact checked, but here we, we really need the people who can work with the data and with, with, uh, with the evidence.
Okay, um, thank you very much indeed for that, um, uh, Vice President. Um, uh, um, we have a question in from uh, Peter uh, Gunning, uh, who thanks you for the very thorough uh, overview you've given. And uh, he, he uh, notes that uh, you say that the Media Freedom Act will contain both legislative and non-legislative measures. And he wanted to ask what the most prominent legislative measures are that the Commission is likely to propose. Mm, I think I, I said it for anti-slap. Uh, yeah. Uh, or maybe more more broadly, for the Media Freedom Act, uh, we will come with the communication which will describe the broader context. And in my view, the broader context which should be explained and described and clarified is the information space on the whole. Yeah, because we we need to be consistent with what we proposed through the Digital Services Act, but we proposed through that uh, regulation uh, on, on, the, on the political advertising uh, and the media. Uh, we have the audiovisual media services directive, which remains fully valid, which has to be implemented. And we are coming with the Media Freedom Act. Uh, and where I want to see consistency is the the philosophy which goes through that. Uh, we need media uh, for two big reasons, the freedom of speech and the access to information. Yeah, this, this goes through everything. Uh, but uh, more uh, maybe concrete reason why we need to be consistent and, and having always the broad picture in, in, uh, in front of us, is how the, the enforcement of all that will be organized in the member states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, media, the Digital Services Act uh, suggests that in the member state will be established a new body which will have the power to oversight the digital space. Some wanted to establish a digital police, can you imagine? <laughs> We are not going there, <laughs> but the enforcers will be in each member state. And my nightmare is that some member states might, might took it as an invitation that they will create one body which will oversight the digital space, the media space, uh, the political advertising uh, rules, and that uh, there will be some, some monstrous uh, regulator created in, in a member state which uh, in case it would not be fully independent from the state, you can imagine what might happen. Mm. Yeah, so, so this is, I have to say, maybe so, something I am obsessed about that, but I lived half of my life in the totalitarian regime. And I remember how strong body was, the Ministry of Information. And it is something which we must not establish. And we know that uh, the, the good intention are paving the way to hell. Yeah, so that's why I speak about the, the consistency and, and uh, the broader picture we have to have in mind. And it should be in the communication accompanying the Media Freedom Act, which will be, however, a purely uh, legally binding set of rules. So there won't be any uh non-legislative part okay okay um um, um seamus dooley um has asked uh, a, a a question he's in the national union journalists here and i i, I know there that um uh, that uh, um, um, uh, if like ensuring diversity in the media is part and parcel of, uh, of what you are, are interested in. But um, uh, Seamus Dooley has a slightly different question. It's how do you protect public service broadcasting, a, a cornerstone uh, he notes of public interest journalism. And uh, he argues that political failure to adequately fund uh, can and is damaging public service broadcasting. Um, uh, and uh, he feels that PSB values, public service broadcasting values, are vital to counteracting fake news. So in other words, the question is, uh, how do you protect public service broadcasting? Mm -hmm. If I expect a big battle around or in, in the process of promoting Media Freedom Act, it will be about the public media. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, legally speaking, we have the Amsterdam Protocol, which is just setting uh, rather general standards and uh, uh, 
we see that uh, to have uh, public media, uh, public service media of high quality as, as the as, as the main source or guaranteed or trustworthy source of of fact checked information and and uh, and and uh, opinions uh, uh, and uh, an uh, arena for everybody uh, who uh, has something to say. Uh, but arena which has some objective rules. This is about the public service media, but we see that uh, the member states have very different systems. And in some member states, we do not see the public media anymore. We see state media. And we have a proverb in Czech language, something like whose bread you eat, his song you sing. I don't know if you have it in Irish language, <laughs> but he, yeah. He, he who pays the piper, I, I think, calls the tune. I think we have as an equivalent expression over here. Oh, so, who somebody. pays the orders? Yeah, yes. and and when when this happens, mm -hmm. and when the the power of the national public money is is engaged in this, it's wrong then we cannot speak about independent public media anymore. Yeah, because it, it is always represented by some state strong figures who as the owners of the money will find themselves obliged or authorized to influence the editorial content. So if you ask me what we want to do in the Media Freedom Act, the short, the short answer is, I don't know yet, <laughs> but I will try to be more precise. Uh, uh, we are now analyzing all member states systems and especially two factors. The way the public media are financed. So how close or distant they are from the national budgets and the influence connected with the national budget from the political side. And the second factor, how uh, independent are the boards which are established to uh, deal with the public media matters and how independent is the management of the public media. So, so again, we will look at the distance between the state and the public slash state media. And we will try to make the distance as long as possible. Mm -hmm. That will be the vector in the Media Freedom Act. And whenever I say this, I, I uh, receive, uh, not me, but my colleagues receive a lot of phone calls. How did you mean it? Our system works, especially in Berlin, uh, there is a lot of, and Munich, there is a lot of nervousness now uh, because in Germany, what I see and what I hear from them, from, from our partners in Germany, uh, they have well-functioning system of public media. And they fear that by Media Freedom Act, we will uh, tend to decrease the standards or prescribe how the system should work. And it's not what we want to do, it's not rather to, to look at the well-functioning systems and to calibrate uh, the standards which should be applied in all the member states and especially looking at the distance between the state and the public media and those factors of money and, and, and people. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much in, indeed. Um, now we have a, a question from um, Sarah Taff McGuire uh, here, who is a, a journalist with the Sunday uh, Business Post. Um, and uh, you mentioned um, um, anti-slap um, um, uh, legislation. That's been, been something that has been quite prominent in the, the media um, uh, here, uh, both here and in the United Kingdom, uh, actually, at, at, at present. Uh, and of course, uh, part and parcel of that um, activity, uh, if you like, is, is deployment or, or the use or the instrumentalization uh, of defamation law. 
uh, and that uh, forms the focus of um, um, uh, Sarah's question because she asks, um, uh, and you, you may not want to get into this now, but but um, uh, she asks, uh, does Vice President uh, uh, Jourova uh, have an opinion on Ireland's defamation laws, which have been described by reporters without borders as presenting significant threats to press freedom? So that's, I suppose, maybe, uh, uh, you know, I, I suppose the relevance in general of defamation laws um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to what you have to say. Yeah, it is our long lasting position that uh, uh, the defamation should disappear from the member states criminal laws. And uh, so uh, uh, this is our opinion, but uh, it's for the member states uh, to decide. Uh, there are not many member states at this moment uh, who have uh, uh, the possibility to sue or to to launch the criminal uh, procedure against the journalists on the basis of the de defamation articles in the criminal criminal uh, codexes, but uh, and, and the, the trend is that uh, recently some member states uh, with, withdrew it or uh, 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 only uh, reduced these possibilities for the civil law procedure or administrative law procedure. Uh, so we. This is this is the long lasting opinion of the Commission, but uh, it is the competence of the Member States. Yeah, so I have to be careful, careful here. I, I, I think in fairness, she's probably referring to civil um, defamation law rather than, than criminal defamation. Law. Oh, it depends uh, even worse in civil procedures. We, <laughs> we have even weaker competencies. Yeah. Uh, uh, we we just want to see in the Member States uh, the possibility to to defend against unprofessional or un, uh, unscrupulous so-called journalists who do not work with data, who even can work in somebody's t-shirt to, uh, to uh, cause harm or to, to dis disregard somebody. Uh, we, we know that there are such cases, uh, but uh, and we, of course, we promote uh, the system where the, there will be equality of the arms yeah, for both sides. Mm -hmm. And it is not at this moment, because we see the too rich and too powerful ones to use this instrument. That's why in the anti-slap legislation, we, we want to uh, embed into the process the possibility for the judges to dismiss the case very soon after they receive it on their tables. And the judges have thousands of questions. We are now consulting with them. Uh, rightly so, because it will be in their everyday practice to, to work with this. And uh, this, uh, this is a very, very frequent question uh, or a comment that it's sometimes not visible at first sight that it is this abusive kind of, of litigation. Okay, and um, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, on the topic of uh, financial imbalance, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, I'm afraid we would probably have to make this the, the, the last question because I see we're about uh, to run, run out of time and my apologies to those of you there, we've had quite a, a number of questions here and it hasn't been possible to reach all of them uh, but does the commission envisage further steps beyond the copyright directive to in, uh, redress the financial imbalance between traditional media and large online platforms which now dominate the advertising market? Mm. Not on copyright uh, I, I, I tell you what must be done on copyright to see on the proper implementation of this uh, heavily fought for uh, legislation. If you remember the dramas, especially in the European Parliament, we have it now. There is a legal possibility for the media to negotiate uh, uh, hopefully favorable conditions. I, I myself, I, I, I still give it some time, but I want to have some uh, do some some check in in the member states where where this, uh, it is because it was meant to uh, radically improve the situation of, of media uh, and push for the the money to shift back <laughs> to where the job is done. Yeah, uh, so it is in the under the remit of of Thierry Breton. It's not mine. Uh, directly, but I, I will speak to him soon to that we should do some some reality check and uh, so so no upgrade of the copyright directive is foreseen. Uh, but uh, there could be uh, more done to improve the situation of media through the recovery money which we distribute to the Member States, 
there is the invest eu program which could be used uh, for uh, for uh, by media as well and uh, some some instruments such as such as the uh, the the loans for innovations and digitalization so there is, there is a blend of money uh, at, at now already in the hands of of the ministers of culture mainly, and I will speak to the ministers of culture on the 7th and 8th of March, and I will ask how they use the EU funding uh, in the media sector. Because what I hear from the media, especially from regional and, and local ones, it's, it's all fine that you are funding from the commission, the, the cross-border investigative teams and, and I don't know technological developments, but we are starving. Yeah, we don't have money for salaries and for for renting the the, the office. So I am I'm aware of this. Uh, this is about bread and butter, and, and when you don't have bread, you don't have to place the butter on. Uh, where to to place the butter on? So we uh, are are really encouraging the the states to to support, but with this big but because. There should not be expectations that the media will pay back by editorial, <laughs> uh, how to say, nice face. <laughs> okay. Listen, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for, for that. Uh, my apologies to the many of you who have put um, uh, questions that we simply haven't been able to um, uh, to reach, but um, um, it's been wonderful to get such detailed uh, answers uh, from the Commission Vice President. I would merely like to thank you on all our behalves for taking time out of your very, very busy um, uh, schedule today. It's been a great honour uh, to have you with us, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, perhaps when things have moved a little bit further down the line uh, in relation to these uh, various initiatives, uh, we might see you again uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, yeah. and find out uh, how things have, uh, have Let me thank you as well. Uh, uh, Thank you also for the questions. If you have ideas, send me an email because I am really a, a good big mushroom just swallowing <laughs> the, uh, the, the rain. So, <laughs> wonderful. So, you're, yeah. you're, op you're open to further ideas. I think, yes, that's of course. If, if somebody will not be able to sleep tonight without having the question or the comment, please uh, send it on. Help yourself. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Madam Vice President. And uh, we, as I said, we hope to welcome you back at some stage in the future. Thank you to all of you uh, who've made the time to join us uh, here today. We hope you will join us uh, on uh, further um, um, uh, institute uh, developments. And uh, in the meantime, have a good weekend. Uh, have a good weekend. Bye. Uh, until the next time.